current events of the year 2002. You know, our Father expects us to be awake. You're, on, you're a watchman. What does a watchman do? He watches. Do you know what the penalty is for going to sleep on watch in the military during wartime? It's death. Very serious thing. And when your spiritual brothers and sisters or your unspiritual brothers and sisters depend upon you for guidance, for direction, or just for a good word, maybe a smile, then don't go to sleep. Be there. Be ready. I, w I want you to open your Bibles to Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1. And we're going to take one verse only. It's verse 14. And God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night. And naturally that would be the sun and the moon. And let them be for signs and for seasons and for the days and years. So things in the heavens, the lights in the heavens, the stars, the moon, they, um, as a matter of fact, I truly believe that there is a Bible in stars when you take the zodiac. And I don't think you should make a religion out of it. And I don't think anyone should become a fanatic in anything. But you should have a well-rounded knowledge of what takes place. Example, I'll use it again from this. At, Paul, at fall Passover of the year 2001, I called it to your attention, those of you who didn't know, that Mars would be prevalent in the heavens more so than ever through the time of the locust, which you put two things together. And that kind of should get your attention. Mars, of course, is the war planet. And when we came near the end of the time of the locusts, we were in war. It was a very unusual war. It is a very unusual war, for it continues. And then as we came on to December the 31st to end last year, what brought in January the 1st was Jupiter in a very unusual situation, bright, and you can still see it. It's fantastic. It's exceptional. So I think we need to refresh ourselves just a little bit as to what um, Jupiter means. Jupiter or Jove. Or if you're a Greek scholar, you would say Zeus. For Zeus is the Greek name for Jupiter. Zeus is... Uh, Supposedly, the Greeks equivalent of the Roman Jupiter. So, um, let's, let's take what happened to bring yourself up to current events. Jupiter comes to opposition after midnight on the American night of December the 31st and January the 1st, 2002 but is actually nearest the Earth the previous night. The planet's magnitude as the year ends is 2.7, just a bit dimmer than in the last few brightest oppositions. The Orion host of constellations is the brightest each year, but this winter we add in the midst a maximum brightness Saturn in Tarsus, and a near maximum brightness Jupiter in Gemini, an extremely rare situation. Now those are the things you kind of want when it's a rare situation. You want it to catch your attention. And um, I'm reading from an astronomical cal calendar put out by the University of uh, North Carolina, I believe it is. Uh, somewhere back in there, North Carolina, South Carolina, and uh, yeah, South Carolina, right? Which um, they do a real good job, and, and uh, you can pretty well count on them. Okay, the, let's talk about the planet for a moment. The giant planet, Jupiter, bulkier than the rest put together, takes nearly 12 years to go around the sun. Thus, it spends a year in each of the 12 zodiacal constellations. Roughly, since the constellations are of unequal width, each year finds it a bit more than 30 degrees 
on around the circle, and so the earth takes another month uh, or more to catch up and pass it. In other words, its oppositions advance from January to February and so on, sometimes skipping a month until there comes a year without opposition. Uh, this is such a year, barely. The last opposition was the year 2000, November the 28th. The next will be 2002, and again on January the 1st. That's kind of unusual. For the four months centered on each opposition, the planet appears to swirl backward and we overtake it, the Earth, that is to say. Thus, this year seems to, uh, the part, sees the parts of two such retrograde loops at the beginning of the year. Just the end of the 2000, November 28th, centered retrogression, and at the end, almost half of the 2002, January the 1st, which was the first of this year. Now, this is important. This is why I brought you here. Listen closely. The former of these two movements takes place against the background of Tarshish. In January, as Jupiter pauses almost motionless in the space between the nearby star clusters of Hyades and Pleiades. Hyades is uh, the rain, and this is mythology, okay? But that's what is written as far as man is concerned, that God uses his signs, even though it is mythology. It is still much brighter than any star or than any planet except Venus, which is more than halfway down from it toward the setting sun. Saturn, now you, you know the myth, well, we'll get into the mythology. Saturn is the planet of Satan, okay? Jupiter is his son. What is Satan's son? Who was God's son? God's son was Jesus. Satan's son is Zeus. I'm, I'm breaking from biblical to, 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 to mythology. But that is the meaning, nevertheless, okay? So who is Satan's son? The Antichrist, of course. Or there is that possibility that it could signify that. That and two bucks will get you a cup of coffee anywhere. But stay awake, all right? They come to a standstill on January the 25th. I repeat, comes to a standstill this January the 25th as almost at almost the same instant, 14th hour and the 15th hour, respectfully, since Jupiter, the nearer, travels both backward and forward, the faster this means that the space between them shrinks to its minimum since their conjunction 7.3 degrees. As they turn and move forward, Jupiter is faster. They will not be so close again until 2020, the year 2020. So there's enough unusual there that Saturn and Jupiter both come to their resting place and stand still on our January the 25th until it causes one to ponder or at least say, hey, we probably need to pay attention to this. Now, I'm going to read to you from Dr. Strong's, the same dear Dr. James Strong that is the composer and compiler of the Strong's Concordance from his 10-volume set of encyclopedias, okay? I will be reading from his work, and we all trust him, and no, it's not something you have to double-check and triple-check, but you're going to get a pretty good basic idea from it concerning Jupiter as it means in mythology. Jupiter or Jove in Roman mythology, the ruler of the gods, the son of the god Saturn, and here you got Saturn and, and Jupiter both pausing at the same time on the 25th of this month, highly unusual, whom he overthrew Originally, the God of the sky and King of heaven. He just thinks he is, okay? He just thinks he is. Again, this is mythology, I caution. Jupiter was worshipped as God of rain, thunder, and lightning, and as the protector of Rome, he was called Jupiter 
Optimus Maximus, the best and the most high, being the translation, and was worshipped in a temple on the Capitolan Hill, was on Mars Hill to us also, as Jupiter Fadus, uh, he was guardian of the law, defender of truth, protector of justice and virtue. The Romans identified Jupiter with Zeus. Now, a lot of people try to tell, well, well we won't go into that. Uh, they'll have, they play games with the word Zeus, all right, and the translation from Yeshua Jesus. Uh, the, there's no connection. I want to make that clear. The supreme god of the Greeks, Zeus, and assigned to the Roman god the attributes and myths of the Greek divinity, the Jupiter of Latin literature, therefore, has many Greek characteristics. Um, but the Jupiter of Roman religious worship remains substantially untouched by the Greek influence with the goddess Juno and Minerva, Jupiter formed the triad, whose worship was the center cult of, um, of the Roman state. That, that's who they worshiped, all right, was Jupiter. If you're not with, there, there is a controversy between God and who? Not Rome, not Saturn, but Satan. But many, Satan utilizes many things. Now, this is why we came here. We're going to go with some of Dr. Strong's report of history, okay, of things that have happened. Jupiter, uh, you will find, translated two times in the New Testament, in the book of Acts, where if you go to the manuscripts, you find the word is not Jupiter, that Paul was called Mercurus, Mercury, and Barnabas was called Jupiter because this, when they were near Rome, because that's who they worshiped. And they thought, these men are so, they're performing miracles, they got to be from Jupiter. They got to be gods, okay? So they named him that, and Paul had a fit, you know? Well, he put a stop to it, basically, anyway. But let's go into a bit of history. And this, this is a part that's very important from Dr. Strong's work. Antiochus, this would be a king during the Maccabees rule, okay? After compelling the children of Judah to call the temple of Jerusalem the temple of Jupiter Olympus, Olympus built an idol altar up on the altar of God. Now, this is history. This happened. Do you want me to say that again? This king ordered an altar built up on top of the altar of God in the temple at Jerusalem. Upon this altar, swine were offered every day. And the broth of their flesh, the swine flesh, was sprinkled about the temple. Your documentation for that is 1 Maccabees, chapter 1, verse 46. I'll be reading that here in a moment from the Apocrypha. Also, 2 Maccabees 6, verse 5. And then your second witness in history, Josephus, the Antiquities 7, chapter 7, or Antiquities numbers, I'm sorry, 12. This is given in Roman numerals, and my cipher wasn't up to speed there, okay? Um, 7 and 12 look a lot different in Roman numerals, don't they? Well, anyway, I messed up, okay? It's Antiquities 12, verse 5, and Antiquities eight, uh, 13, verse 8, and then there is another book, War One. okay? There, there's where you can find documentation that the swine letting in the temple of God. Can you imagine during the time, this is from the time of Daniel up until Christ actually walked the earth during the period of the Maccabees. The idol altar, which was upon the altar of God, was considered by the tribe of Judah to be the abomination of desolation foretold by Daniel 
And of course, th this states that it's Daniel chapter 11, verse 31. I would correct that to say it's first mentioned in Daniel chapter 9, verse 27. And mentioned by our Lord in Matthew 24, 15. It was also mentioned by our Lord, the abomination of desolation, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing where it ought not, by Jesus Christ in Mark chapter 13. And this is why this is all brought forward and should become very important to you to the point as a watchman you would want to take note. Naturally, that was not, even though that was a terrible thing, it was only a type of the abomination to put swine's broth about the temple of God and swine flesh sacrificed on the very altar of God, which he forbids. But you see, it's what Daniel's talking about is spiritual, and I suppose through the type, you can get a better grasp of the abomination when God sees the son of Satan or the false messiah, his role as false messiah, standing in Jerusalem claiming to be God at the altar of God. That's the true abomination, and that's why this could not have been because Jesus foretold that it was yet future in Matthew chapter 24, okay? Got that? So, um, the um, meaning of the prophecy has been given uh, many renditions, and that is true. So, um, real quickly, I like to document what we're talking about. I'm going to... This is uh, Edgar J. Goodspeed, the best apocrypha you will ever be able to buy. These books were in the original King James Bible. They were taken out because the apocrypha was not canonized. And as, as we stated, I'm going to go to Mac, 1 Maccabees chapter 1, and I'm going to start reading with verse 44. And the king, this is history now, okay? And the king sent word by messengers to Jerusalem and to the towns of Judah to follow practices foreign to the country and to put a stop to whole burnt offerings and sacrifices and drink offerings at the sanctuary. How do you change people's beliefs? You change their religion. And to break the Sabbath and profane the feast and pollute the sanctuary and sanctified to build altars and sacred uh, pre uh, precincts and idol temples and sacrifice hogs and unclean cattle and to leave their sons uncircumcised and defile themselves with every unclean and profane practice so that they might forget the law and change all their religious ordinances and anyone who did not obey the commandment of the king should die. So you either went along with him, or the penalty was death. Now what is the difference? And as much as this was a type during the Machines time of the abomination of desolation, then teaching your sons and daughters to worship the first Messiah that comes back to fly people away. What's the difference? I mean, to God it's an abomination. And that's a little bit stern, but <clears throat> hey, you either have faith in the true God and his word, or you don't. You're playing. You're play acting. If you allow someone to come in by the traditions of men and make void the whole word of God by saying it's just a bunch of riddles, no man could write riddles such as Christ's crucifixion a thousand years before the fact, as to even what the enemy would, the words that would be coming out of the enemy's mouth. That's a heretic. And it changes the values. And God does not like it. So it's important when you come to the signs and the seasons. That is an abomination. Look around you today. How many people actually study God's word chapter by chapter and verse by verse to receive the true blessings from God as we do? Well, I don't know. I never visit too many, but I'm, and I'm not going to judge them. But every once in a while, I'll tune the old tube around and I'll listen to one or two. 
I don't hear too many teaching God's Word. They're blowing hot air. And I'm not judging them, that's just what they're doing, okay? They're talking about traditions of men. And quite frankly, if you mislead God's children, where they do not even know the chronological order of events that transpire, how could they watch the seasons and the times? Because they don't know what tomorrow brings or even what today is. Because they're not taught. They're not taught the Word of God. You either study God's Word and have faith in Him, or you will not have His blessings. You will be cursed to the point that those that the nation that does follow God will have to come along and clean up your mess every once in a while, or you couldn't exist. And that's what we're having to do today. And I thank God that we have an administration that is basically aware of that. Okay? Now, <clears throat> There you have a type of the abomination of death. You know, I, I'm really proud. There's one thing I take great pride in that. Somewhere between Maccabees and the higher critics of today, then they respected Daniel's writings. Today, a lot of the higher critics say that Daniel's work is fake, fraud. Not acceptable. Well, you can always spot a nut by the crack in his head. Okay? You know, why would Jesus have mentioned Daniel and the abomination of desolation if it wasn't a correct writing? And the answer is, it's a very good writing. It's simply an overlay of the great book of Revelation. If you understand one, you understand the other. Now, what does this have to do as we look forward? First, let me back up just a bit. What about this January the 25th? I don't know. It's just going to be an interesting time. When you see Saturn from, from position Earth, now understand me, from position Earth, when you see Saturn and Jupiter both at the same one hour apart, park in the heavens, Whoa, that's different, okay? Very different. Then that should have your attention. Is it a benchmark? I'm, now, I'm just kind of helping you. Is to, don't get carried away. Don't, don't run off somewhere. And, Pastor Murray said the world's going to end January the 25th. Now, that's not what I said, okay? I did not even imply that. But as a watchman, there are benchmarks that come along where there are changes. Now, because Mars gave us a true indication in this past year, that causes one to kind of let their attention focus upon this. Because things are about to happen. As a matter of fact, let's face it, look around you, turn your news on, things are happening. What has this got to do with the Word of God? We, you must always affix current events with the Word of God or it won't fly, friend. It just doesn't apply. Open your Bibles to Isaiah, the great book of Isaiah. Let's go with chapter 65. God speaking to his children. Isaiah chapter 65, an answer is given here to the prior chapter. So, but I want to grab the first four or five verses here. Let's read it. I am sought, Isaiah 65 verse 1, I am sought of them that ask not for me. I am found of them that sought me not. I said, Behold me, behold me, unto a nation that was not called by my name. Verse 2, I have spread out my hands all the day unto a rebellious people, which walketh in a way that is not good after their own thoughts. Oh, do you want to listen to me, brother? I'm so intelligent, you don't need the word of God. It's all mythology. It doesn't amount to a hill of beans. Listen to me. 
Well, you think you're God? The quickest way to rob yourself of God's blessings and be a nothing is to take that attitude. God doesn't like it. Don't f never follow your own thoughts or anyone else's. You should think, but you had better align it with God's word or you're out of step. Okay? A people that provoketh me to anger continually to my face that sacrificeth in gardens and burneth incense upon altars of brick instead of God's altar, which remain among the graves or the tombs and lodge in the monuments, which eat swine's flesh and broth of abominable things is in their vessels. How, how many people know the health laws? You know, God created these bodies and he sent this book along as how to stay well and not be sick. And, um, I, and then people will say, well, I asked for a healing, but it didn't last. Well, did you follow health laws or did you make yourself sick all over again because you were ignorant of God's health laws? Okay, they're important. Right? That stuff will kill you. Verse 5, which say, Stand by thyself, come not near to me, for I am holier than thou. These are a smoke in my nose, a fire that burneth all the day. God says, they bother me so bad, they're like smoke in my nostrils. Those holy Joes that are holier than thou. You don't understand, we're special people. Ooh. Well, God doesn't like that, okay? All children are God's children. Different people have different duties to perform according to God's word. And watchmen are to watch. But you see, why I wanted you to see the abomination of this thing is it wasn't a new thing even in the time of the Maccabees. Now turn on with me to chapter 66. We're, we're here, you're going future of where we are even now, okay? Uh, let's see if we can document that. Uh, verse 25 of chapter 65, the chapter we were just reading, just so you're, you understand chronologically where we are so that you milk the truth from this. The 25th verse reads, The wolf and the lamb shall feed together, and the lion shall eat straw like the bullock. The uh, dust shall be the serpent's meat. Thou shalt not hurt nor destroy in my holy mountain, saith the Lord. In other words, he's talking about the millennium and past. So that you can fix yourself chronologically. Verse six, chapter 66, verse 1. Thus saith the Lord, the heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. Where is the house that you build unto me and where is the place of my rest? In other words... What God is saying, he's kind of shaming us. You know, people will say, well, will this be a house of God. Um, you see that door over there in that frame? God created that material that's made out of. He didn't, he, he you know, and, and this carpet, I don't know what kind of fiber that is, but he made that. Okay. And the whole world is his house. And he's kind of bringing us up to speed here about, don't mess with me, kids. You're going to build me something fancy. I made it all. You can't build it for me. I created it a long time ago. It's called kind of a comeuppance in life. Okay, verse 2. For all the, those things hath mine hand made. I made them. And all those things have been, saith the Lord, but to this man will I look, even to him that is poor and of a contrite mind, spirit, humbled, if you would, uh, or crushed, even if you may humble before him, and trembles at my word. Three, this is how he looks at his church just before the time of things that he predicts will be taught at that time. He says, he that killeth an ox is as if he slew a man. Do you know how God feels about human sacrifice? He said, it, Moloch practice, Moloch. He said, it never came to my mind 
burning your children. He that sacrifices a lamb as if he cut off a dog's neck. In other words, you try to play church and you try to try to play religion and you know absolutely not what you're talking about. I won't accept it, is what he's saying. If you, if you put the false before the true, I just assume you'd cut a pig open on my altar as to offer yourself if you're not a follower of my word. And if he cut off a dog, as he cut off a dog, he that offer an oblation as if he offered swine's blood. He that burneth incense as if he blessed an idol. In other words, you can go to church all you want to if you don't ever get around to studying God's word and making a, a um, and I'm not judging anybody. I'm saying, what do you go to church for anyway? If you don't go there to study God's word, you're wasting your time. Well, I, I, I like to play Monopoly and wear my nice stuff. Well, in God's eyes, you don't look so hot anyway, even with your nice stuff. If you're not in, if your spirit isn't right. Do you understand what I'm saying? I know that may sound hard to some, but beloved, God sees you as you are, as you think in your spiritual body. God never created any body that wasn't very nice, okay? By that I mean looking good, all right, in the spiritual body. Yea, they have chosen their own ways. Well, I just like to make up my own mind. I don't care about reading God's Word. It's just a bunch of mythology anyway. Boy, you're cruising for a bruising. Man, are you removing yourself from where blessings flow. And their soul delighteth in their abominations. I also will choose their delusions, their devices. I'm going to see they get messed up and will bring their fears upon them because when I called, none did answer. And when I spake, they did not hear, but they did evil before mine eyes and chose that in which I delighted not. Uh, putting Satan, the false Messiah, off as the true Christ is an abomination to God. It's an insult. Hear the word of the Lord, verse 5, ye that tremble at his word, your brethren that hated you, that cast you out for my namesake. Not for any other reason. For my namesake. His word. Say, say, said, let the Lord be glorified, but he shall appear to your joy, and they shall be ashamed. Stick to God's word and never be ashamed. There may be some that mock it and poo-paw it. Let them poo-paw theirself all the way to hell. You stick with God's word. It's not mythology, history, documents, that ever, and there is nothing in God's word that contradicts. It's just that you might be a little ignorant of his word. Okay, you need to study deeper. Nothing contradicts itself in the word of God properly translated. Verse 6. A voice of noise from the uh, city, a voice from the temple, a voice of the Lord that rendereth recompense to his enemies. But she travailed, she brought forth before her pain came, she was delivered of a man child. This is looking forward to the birth of the new age. This is what it meant by when Jesus said in Matthew 24. Uh, the travail there is labor pains, the birth of a new age, moving on into the millennium period. Who hath heard such a thing? Who hath seen such things? Shall the earth be made to bring forth in one day, or shall a nation be born at once? For as soon as Zion travailed, she brought forth her children. It will be born in one day. The day Messiah sets foot upon this earth, the whole new Zion is reinvigorated and brought to be in a small family, becomes a whole nation, as a chapter or so prior to this in Isaiah stipulates. So you're in that time, my friend, and it's a time to be watchful 
and to understand those labor pains are growing closer and closer together of the birth of this new age. I think you kind of experienced, some of you had that experience of knowing from watching the signs that it was no great surprise when the event transpired, yet it was. But you were warned. Be warned now from, and stay in God's word. Let's, uh, let's to conclude this, go to the book of the Minor Prophets. I want to go to the book of Micah. And we're going to align current events with God's word. Kind of like, where are we right now? Watch the signs, my friend. Do not make a religion out of them and do never be a religious fanatic. But at the same time, don't be foolish and denounce Almighty God. Chapter, uh, especially His Word. Chapter 5, verse 1. Let me say something about this chapter and others that we have read. There is an ancient text called the Masara that locks in these scriptures whereby man can't play with them. And you might say, well, man wrote the Masa. Yep, he did. At God's abiding. But one from Europe and another from China were found and they're exactly the same, basically. The original footnotes both the major and the minor Masara, that God's word could not be changed. You can have faith in God's word. Chapter 5, the great book of Micah, Minor Prophets. Let's read it. Now gather thyself in troops, O daughter of troops. He hath laid siege against us. They shall smite the judge of Israel with a rod upon the cheek. Uh, what is a troop for? War. What kind of war are you fighting? Well, you have a spiritual war and you have a physical war. They're both going on now. But thou, Bethlehem Ephrathah, thou, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall come forth unto me that is to be the ruler of Israel, whose goings forth have been from of old, from everlasting. In other words, it was decreed Emmanuel, God with us from the beginning. Okay, and uh, your verse three. Therefore, will he give them up until the time that she which travaileth hath brought forth? In other words, when was that? The, hey, the calendar changed. It isn't hard to spot. It, there was a sign. You give the sun, moon, stars are given for signs and seasons and dates. Have you ever looked at a calendar? What year are we? Two thousand two. What? Anno Domine. Well, what does Anno Domine mean? It means the year of our Lord. It means the year she brought forth. Okay? The whole world changed its calendar. But it stopped until that birth she travailed and brought forth. Then the remnant of his brethren shall return unto the children of Israel. And he, he who, Messiah, shall stand and feed in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. The name of who? The name of the Lord his God. Emmanuel, God with us. Yeshua, in the Hebrew tongue, Yahweh's Savior. And they shall abide, for now shall he be great unto the ends of the earth. For how long? Up to today and forever. He's going to be great. Why? You can count on him. Do you know something? He has the ability and the power and the authority to forgive your sins. Oh, brother, you don't understand. I don't have any sins. Oh, ooh. You're holier than us, aren't you? Anyway, verse 5. And this man shall be the peace. Who is the prince of peace? 
Melchizedek. Have you ever heard of him, Prince of Peace? When the Assyrian shall come into our land. Do you know what the Assyrian is? Isaiah chapter 14 stipulates him as the type of the Antichrist. Okay. We had some Assyrians came into our land not long ago. They were evil. And when he shall tread in our palaces, then shall we raise against him seven shepherds and eight principal men. Seven is the 7,000 and Christ makes the eight leading God's election. Seven means spiritual completeness, however many it takes. Okay. And they shall waste the land of Assyria with the sword and the and the land of Nimrod in the entrances thereof, thus shall he deliver us from the Assyrian when he cometh into, into our land and when he treadeth within our borders. That's not nice. It's not nice for somebody to come in and blow up a couple of our buildings. It's not, we won't tolerate it. God says we don't have to. And we have just about destroyed his nest, his land, with what? Truth and hot stuff, okay, which he deserved. This is both the land of Babylon. When you speak of the land of Nimrod, you're speaking of the land of Babylon and the Assyrian. I mean, we're getting right down where the rubber meets the road. Well, Where's Babylon? Iraq. You ever heard of it? Verse 7. And the remnant of Jacob shall be in the midst of many people as the dew from the Lord. Dew is the purest water and truth there is. As the shadows uh, showers rather upon the grass that tarrieth not for man, nor waiteth for the sons of men. In other words, the tender truth. What is that? What is truth? Fairness. Making that that is right wrong and destroying evil. That's what we're in the business of. Destroying evil. And freeing captivated people. The women in the lands so far that we have freed had no rights. It was pitiful. They treated like animals. In heathenistic customs. All in the name of religion. All in the name of doing it for God. Verse 8, and the remnant of Jacob shall be among the Gentiles in the midst of many people as a lion among the beast of the forest, as a young lion among the flocks of sheep, who, if he go through, both treadeth down and teareth in pieces, and none can deliver. Beloved, we are the superpower of superpowers. Do you think that's an accident? Do you think it just happened? Now, we have God's blessings, and we save those that depend upon us, that need us, that need God. And we have it. Who can come against us unless it's just, unless it's just a, a terrorist act or some thief or robber in the night? And don't worry, we'll get him. There's nobody can come against us. Why? God is with us. And if God be with you, who can be against you? No one. Anyone that would doubt when they see the brilliance of the minds of our men in the field as to how we have allowed a country so far, so far, I mean, that means up to this point, to maintain its dignity by freeing itself, basically, with a lot of help from us. We did not strip them of their dignity. Their men and women that basically freed themselves. Therefore, they will treasure that freedom a lot more than had it been handed to them on a platter. And basically it was. Okay. You all know what I'm talking about, don't you? You know I'm talking about Afghanistan. And you know I'm talking about the evil from Syria, Saudi Arabia, Egypt, all over the land that filtered into that place. 
not any of the nations nor the Islamic religion, but the vile teachings straight from the Antichrist that was brought in those camps training young men. It's fun to die. If it's so much fun to die, it's, it's kind of funny how those suckers are running like rabbits looking for a hole to crawl into now. I'm talking about the leadership, you know. I don't believe they believe what they teach, do you? I hardly think so. Verse 9. Thine hand shall be lifted up un upon thine adversaries, and all their en thine enemies shall be cut off. What is our weapon? Truth, fairness, what is right. What a time for this great nation brought out for God the tribes that migrated and settled here with God's blessings. Fantastic. Verse 10, And it shall come to pass in that day, saith the Lord, that I will cut off thy horses out of the midst of thee, and I will destroy thy chariots. Woo, that, that sounds scary, doesn't it? God's going to destroy, or take away, rather, your military forces. What does God want you to depend on? Him. Who's going to fight the battle of Haman Gog? It won't be our army. It doesn't mean he's going to destroy it. It means he's going to take over. He's going to destroy our enemies for us. Ezekiel chapter 38, verses 1 through 4. Verse 11, And I will cut off the cities of thy land, and throw down all thy strongholds. Strongholds of what? Our enemy. Well, dear God, I didn't realize we had any enemies right here in our own country. Oh, you didn't. <laughs> oh, you have you ever heard of socialism? Have you ever heard of those that trash what good men try to do? Do you think they're with us? Do you think they're for us? God's going to weed them out. So you'd better be for God, with God, and serving God. Or your chances are looking pretty slim. That is to say, those outside of uh, the truth. Verse 12. And I will cut off witchcrafts out of thine hand. Now God didn't say, I'm going to send somebody to cut off witchcraft out of your hand. He said, I'm going to do it. And thou shalt have no more soothsayers. You're not going to have any of these slick-talking uh, soothsayers. You know what a soothsayer will usually talk soothe soothingly for? For your money, okay? You know, like, well, we're going, to have, we're going to do something religious. Before we start this meeting, we're going, to, we're going to have pass the hat, you know. Do something very religious here. And then when you get ready to go out of the door, he'll say, oh, I just forgot, it's my birthday, pass the hat again. Okay. Wonder what he's got on his mind. Okay. It's money, of course. May God I thank God He has freed us from that hang up. No more soothsayers. Who does God expect you to listen to? Him. He expects you to listen to Him. And God has a way of touching you. When you're in His Word. He touches you with blessings whereby you get ahead in life by staying focused and discipline yourself in his way and word. 13, thy graven images also will I cut off. We're going to get rid of the junk. And thy standing images out in the midst of thee. That means um, anything that stands against you that you call worship when it's not really supposed to be. That means false teachings of any kind. And thou shalt no more worship the work of thine hands. Oh, but God, we built it for you. 14. And I will pluck up thy groves out of the midst of thee, so will I destroy thy cities. That's to say, your cities were what goes on. Well, I don't know. I don't make it too down to the city too often. But I've heard kind of what goes on in some of them. He's not talking about the whole thing. He's talking about that that's perverted. 
He's going to do away with it. Zippo, gone. What about these groves? Do you know what the grove? That's where ritual fertility rites took place and worshiping bodies rather than God. That's where Ishtar, where people, some Christians that don't know any better, are called Easter. It's the word Ishtar. You know, you take a college Webster's Dictionary and look up the word Easter. I'm talking about a complete one now. I'm not talking about some little flu flossy handbook, okay? Do you know what it will tell you? It will say Easter property, Ishtar, a heathen religion of spring fertility rites. But, you know, we could get a lot more people in church by calling it that instead of the Greek proper, which is the Hebrew apostle, which is Passover. It happens. He's going to get rid of all that. He's going to destroy that that is evil. Well, where, where is that written in the New Testament? Well, I can tell you real easy. It's 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10. I'm going to destroy with fervent heat the stontion in the Greek. Do you know what stontion is? It means the rudiments, evil rudiments, not the good. God doesn't have, in other words, God's blowtorch would not send your feathers even. Just like the three Hebrew children in the fiery furnace. Did they burn up? Were their clothes smoked? No. Well, do you believe that? I certainly do. Because the presence of God can destroy who he wishes to destroy, and he loves his children. You have nothing to fear. Verse 15, and I will execute vengeance. This is kind of what we came here for. You know when the day of vengeance is? Think about it now. Now, don't just slide over it. Think about it. When is the day of vengeance? It's when Christ returns, okay? I will execute vengeance and anger and fury upon my dear, lovely little children. Is that what it says? I will execute vengeance and anger and fury upon the heathen such as they have not heard. That means someone that doesn't love God, all right? Or that has not taken advantage of the teachers and the people such as yourself that share truth and plant seeds and, and uh, bring truth uh, forward. What a fantastic time to live. You know, as it's written, even the prophets wanted to live through this time. You know, they really did. Because you're seeing things that many years ago, I can remember when prophecies were far and few in between. And it seems like those labor pains, it's just about time to load her up. Well, that's not nice, is it? It's about, whoa, it's about time to deliver, okay? When, when, oh my goodness. Here I had a good thing going up till then. Well, hey, back in my day, that's what we had to do, you know? Anna and I had a military base. We were in the military when both of the boys were born. And here I am on national television. How did I... But we had a long way to go, you know, and, and, uh, and I had a Rocket 98 <laughs> Ozomobile. <laughs> anyway, different subject, different time. Hey, keep your eyes open. Concentrate. Watch. No one knows exactly what's going to happen, but God does send signs. We've, we've had one, friend. You should have been prepared for this war we're in now a long time before it happened on September the 11th. He warned you. He's warning us again. If I were you, I'd be, this is going to be a wonderful year. Well, doesn't that frighten you? No, praise God, I'm ready. All right? Bring on the enemy, you know, because we're armed. We've got it made. We really do. We have the weapon that cannot be defeated. That is to say, the sword of the Lord, which is to say, the truth. But, and we have his blessings. So, never be afraid of end times. 
when you're in God's presence. That is to say, when you're in him and he is in you. Because you have nothing to fear. He didn't say, I'm going to hurt the ones I love. He said, I'm going to destroy my enemies. Okay? And you have nothing to fear. He loves you. Okay, Heavenly Father, we thank you, Father, for the written word. We thank you, Father, for the signs. Father, when we don't even totally see clearly and understand, let us be forewarned as this year transpires. And we are ready servants of thine, Father. We ask it in Yeshua, Jesus' precious name. Amen.